Hi everyone, my name's Sean. Um, I am data consultant, maybe is a bit aspirational. I'm a contractor. Uh, I, I get called in. I get more cynical as the contract goes on. Um, this week I've been working at a retailer. In a few weeks time I'll be working at a bank. Um, I've been doing this for about three years contract and five years uh, employee before. So I've seen multiple companies on their journey with Power BI and I've always been part of the BI team. And this is a more kind of zoomed out strategic um, kind of weird talk. So it's um, hopefully you enjoy it. It's, it's hopefully compliments, Chris. Um, so we're zooming out a little bit. We're thinking about running a department full of Power BI developers. We're thinking about what they can do to be really effective, cost effective for the company. The data model is key. Um, I should probably explain what the data model is. I'm, I'm sure you all know. Um, the data model is the fact and dimension table, Kimball, Immon, the warehouses, the marts, the single source of truth that the company looks to. So when they say, how many customers do we have? Hopefully somewhere in your company, there's a customer table with one row per customer. There probably isn't, but that in an ideal world would be. That is the data model. This is the vital economics of Power BI delivery. Right, quick poll. Um, who is hands on with Power BI or a data worker of some sort in their organization? Brilliant. Quick poll number two. Who feels that they have the main decision about which reporting projects you take on as a team? Less hands. <laughs> um, question number three. And remember, if you put your hand up for this one, who could identify or feels they could identify the person who has the main decision power in their organization about which projects get the green light and which projects get the red, red light? OK, right. Just remember who you were. In a minute, I'm going to ask you to put your hand up again. And then I'm going to ask you to lower your hand if the following is true. So hands up if you just put your hands up. You can identify who, who makes decisions. Does the person who makes decisions in your company pay any kind of visible hands-on attention to the current data model in the organization? Yeah, OK. The people who still have their hands up, well done. I hope life is really good. Has everything worked out fine in your organizations? Okay. Interesting. I thought it was going to be a full hands down. It was about two thirds hand down by the look of things. So the people who are making decisions, they're not really paying attention to the data model. In the grand scheme of things, the data model is a central pivotal position. So we've got the ETL pipelines coming in. If you're in a big company, if you're a one person shop, you're doing all this yourself. But the data pipelines are coming in from your seven strong ETL um, data engineering team. They, they come into this data warehousing engine in this dedicated pool in Synapse or something like that, or SQL Server or whatever it is you're using for your single source of truth. And then they go out into Power BI along with the front end. So data models right in the middle of this crucial process. And it seems like most of the decision makers don't pay attention to it. We're hoping to change that. So this is this is a weird and wonderful talk. Um, we're going to start with a prelude. It's an analogy. Um, I was born in Chester, which is just to the left. I live in Leeds now at the moment. Manchester's right in the middle. When I was 15, a, a typical kind of data worker upbringing, I was I was in the chess club, uh, as you are, and I was playing a game of chess against the deputy head in my school called Mr Hargreaves. And I was playing my strategy which is always my strategy, you win chess by capturing the pieces. So I was really paying attention to where his pieces were and how I could maneuver my force to attack his position, to cajole the pieces, to try and trap them, to do beneficial trades. I was really thinking about where he was on the board and how I could get my pieces to go over his pieces and capture them. I was playing against uh, Mr Hargreaves. He was an older gentleman, a uh, deputy head. He was a tired tired day because he's been working all day. I definitely had cognitive firepower on my side. I was a clean living 15 year old, good at maths. He's an English teacher. Um, I should I should be able to I should be able to batter him. <laughs> I was playing to that strategy and Mr Hargreaves did a move that made no sense to me. Um, we had we were kind of trading off threats and suddenly his queen just went out into the middle of nowhere. His queen was doing useful work before she was threatening like three of my pieces. And then he just puts her into this kind of empty space. There's just vacuum on the board. 
And I, I stopped immediately because it made no sense. He he couldn't possibly have meant to make that move. It just didn't make any sense to my paradigm, my strategy that I was playing to. He was taking a useful position where he's he's kind of attacking my places and then just makes her into a useless, vacant space. And he let me in on his strategy. And his strategy was he was playing to control the board. So he was trying to think about the space of possibilities, which is an eight by eight square. And he was trying to, he, he was talking about lines of influence and he was talking about areas of the board that were high ability and low ability. This didn't make any sense to me, but it was obvious that he was playing a completely different game. It's fair to say he won every time, every single time. And it was very much like the, the picture in that he managed to outmaneuver me and that I just didn't have space to deploy my troops because he had control of the board. He was he was getting the right positions to really get the threats where I wasn't. We're bringing it back to the real world. Your organization is building a data system. And I'd argue that's at least as complicated as playing chess against Mr. Hargreaves. Um, your organization must decide where and how effort is spent, and how you play the game. So this is this is how people decide to play the game. You've got a beautiful, collaborative, um, symbiotic, kind of equal amongst peers um, relationship between the data team and, and the business. And everyone's kind of respectful of each other and they're saying, what's your opinion and what's your opinion? That's the ideal scenario. Um, that's not the underlying economics of it, though. So um, if you go on LinkedIn and talk about um, being a data team versus the business, they say um, they say you shouldn't distinguish yourself from the business. You are in the business too. We're all in the business together. You're not an IT professional. You're a business professional. However, there is an economic difference between the data team and the business, and that's the business is really generating the money for your salary. So they're the ones going out and selling the product. They're the ones going and delivering on the projects. They're generating profit, and they're using that profit to um, supplement your service as an internal function. So the power all lies with the business who's got this profit revenue generation. On a finances balance sheet, you're a cost center. So this is the natural way that's going to evolve. The natural equilibrium for that relationship is for you to listen to the demands of the business. It's only fair. It's their money. They should decide how it gets spent. And you will become a, a waiter. What's wrong with that? So I've done this. I've done this for years. and you get surrounded by happy, smiling faces. No one is more happy to see you than a customer who has a, a legitimate problem that they've identified and they come to you and you can help them and you can help them quickly. Is there anything wrong with that, being um, surrounded by happy, smiling faces? Yes, the organization will lose the game. So they're the ones calling the shots. They're the ones with the strategy. Um, I'll give you a hint of the future. They're playing strategy one, two, just like I was. The organization will only realize a small piece of its potential. You will waste your potential. You'll be stuck on square one. You could be doing machine learning and kind of building out this amazing system, but instead you're getting kind of dragged from project to project throughout this system. And waste is a sin. We can all agree that waste is the cardinal sin. Say again? So, sorry. It can be money. <laughs> money, yeah, yeah. Mm. Right, two strategies. Strategy one, aim for the pieces. Identify your target, try and move in on that target. Strategy two, control the board. They both start the same. So the chess game always starts the same. Uh, this is a really weird talk, by the way. So just if you're enjoying it, great. If you're not enjoying it, just turn off. <laughs> In the beginning is the void. It's, it's, it's never a void. It's always, um, it's always an Excel legacy of kind of 17 different pivot tables. But <laughs> let's pretend that it's a void. But if you look carefully, you will see an ocean of possibility, a business value. So I've actually, I've actually labeled the business value. I've pretended that we can quantify it in advance. We've got a 2.3 million pound cluster over here. We've got a 0.7 million pound cluster up here, and we've got a 0.9 million pound cluster. 
The first thing to um, recognize is there's loads of business value. This is maybe me just doing my biases. Um, some companies seem to treat business value as though it's some kind of scarce gem that you have to assemble a, a 10 person strong team of business analysts from Accenture or Deloitte to actually identify how the hell you could have any business value with data. I don't see it that way. I, I kind of see it every single stone you want to turn in a business has loads of potential for business value. Um, right. It's worth saying business value is how you win the game. So if you if you can unlock that 2.3 million pound cluster, you have won the game. Kind of. Specifically, business value for low cost. So what you can't do is spend £7 million to unlock that £2.3 million because you've just made a massive loss. Same for the 0.7. It's all about return on investment. How cheaply can you get that £2.3 million? Right, you'll identify the first targets. I say you. The the organization will see a need. They'll see they'll see a reporting need. Perhaps for a service desk, they need to know which customers are buying which products. Or um I, I know how this talk goes, but um, but which customers are visiting which bits of the website. So you, you'll identify the first targets. The the business recognizes there's a need. The targets have been put in red. Again, lots of business value. They've identified a little bit of it. You will build the first data model or the organization will, which is a structure which sits in this space of possibilities. We all know what a data model is. We've got our dimension tables up here and we've got our fact tables here connected in this network of nodes. Building the data model is expensive. It's, in my experience, it's where about 70% of the resources on any reporting project go. Um, if anyone has a different experience, um, please tell me. But, that seems to be the main thing, especially if you've got multiple systems. Trying to get one customer table out of three different CRM systems is a bit of a, a nightmare. So it's very expensive. To make it more real and concrete, so it's just not um, blank nodes in space, we've got a um, customer table in the middle, product table on the outside, web page table, those are our dimensions. And then we've got a page view, customer clicking on a web page. We've got a sale, which is a customer buying a product. We can see that the first reporting uh, need was served over here by the customer product sales triangle. And we've got our page view, which is web page, page view customer, which um, satisfies the second reporting need. You harvest the first value. So you've successfully built the data model. You've successfully made your report. You've harvested that value the business set, set you for. This is what the business sees. So the business doesn't see your data model. They don't see this structure that you've built in this space of possibilities. They just see you've delivered two reports out of lots of reports that they could have. This is what your boss sees. So um, kind of the, the mouths of chicks. Um, kind of, we'll, we'll go further forward, but as soon as you deliver to one part of the business, let's say you've delivered to service delivery, the first thing that's gonna happen is they've got a shiny new toy. The finance department want the same shiny new toy. The HR department want the shiny new toy. And the projects team want the shiny new toy as well. This is where we start to go into strategy one. So up till now, both strategies have been the same. You're just playing the opening moves. This is where we start to go down the strategy one path. This is what your boss sees. Service delivery, they've happy. They, they've got the shiniest Power BI report in the entire organization. Everyone else is jealous of them. And they're piping up and saying, we need one too. This is what the business sees. So this same view, different different uh, analogy. Service delivery, they've got their piece of cake. No cake for anyone else. We all agree sharing's gotta be fair. So you can't keep giving bits of cake to service delivery. If you've already given them one bit of cake and everyone else has no cake, that would be really unfair. So that's not allowed. You've got to do this. However, the departments all require completely separate data models. So the finance department, they're thinking about purchase orders and invoices and fixed assets and depreciation. Great. You didn't have any of that in your original data model. HR want um, employees and sick days and holidays and their Bradford score. Um, you didn't have any of that in your original data model. And projects are thinking about their specific projects, regardless of who sold what, and the budget associated with them. Again, not in your data model. You've built four data models. Building data models is really expensive. So. If you're going to make these huge outlays and investments as a business, 
you've really got to justify them by capturing a lot of that space of possible value. But fair, fair is fair. You've given a bit of cake to all of the people in all the departments. They're all equally happy. You've built all the expensive data models, so you've, you've spent quite a lot of money here. You deliver a bit of business value for each department. You've delivered the thing that they decided they wanted three months before you built the data model. And managed to lobby it through the committee that decides how your spending gets um, given. This is the I am kind of leading the witness here, but this is the final accounting. Uh, big cost. You've built a lot of expensive data models, four of them. Low value. You delivered a bit of value, which is the bit that the business pre-identified um, months before you built the data model, with each one for each each department. Business value, if we remember back at, back in the, the day, is how you win, and you didn't harvest very much considering how much it cost you. But fair is fair. So you've 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 stopped that chick, um, kind of whingy whiny chick problem, and you've given equal pieces of cake to each department. Fair is fair. The organization lays off half its data function. You've spent loads of money. You've delivered almost no value. But really, times are hard. Costs have to be cut. We're going to invest in sales who are actually bringing the money in. Because the business didn't pay any attention to the economics of data models. So um, we've got a blind per, um, a person with a blindfold with a bow and arrow pointing in the wrong direction. They're, they're really happy, just like I was when I was playing against Mr. Hargreaves. I was, I was playing chess, I was making moves, I was strategizing, I was in control. They're really happy, but they're still playing strategy one. Strategy two, playing to control the board. So this is, this is the alternate path that you could have gone down. Let's rewind, let's go back to the beginning. You're in the void, the business has identified their targets. You've You've built the first data model. Both strategies start the same. You've built it. You've made that first big initial outlay. The mistake one, so that the first mistake the business made when they were playing this game is they left loads of easily reachable value unexplored. This is my favorite slide. So this is the, this is the slide that um, kind of gave me the idea to do this specific talk. The, the data model radically changes the economics of delivery. So in this butterfly shape, essentially we've torn a hole in the space of possibilities. We've got customer in the middle. That's a solid customer table. We've got product. We've got one row per product. It's clean sales. That entire space of possibility where the butterfly is, you basically get a 90% coupon to say you can build any reporting in that space and you don't need to build a data model at all. You've got one data model that already is perfectly fit for purpose. Lots of potential, uh, potential business value falls in, within the scope of that data model. Yes, the, the, the organization only identified two bits at the beginning, but actually there's loads and it's really easy and cheap to explore and harvest it. So here, we've what we've done is instead of Instead of um, saying you've got your target service delivery, you've got your target uh, marketing or whatever it is, uh, the one you predefined um, three months ago, um, we said we've got this structure in place now. We're going to listen out really acutely, get our antennae out, and if any business value, um, if any business problems fall inside this structure, we're going to harvest them because it's quick and easy. So the first thing is we've collected the quick wins. We, we found some, uh, we unlocked some value around customer. We unlocked some value over here around web page, and there was some value that we managed to get up here, and we've extended this value down. So we've got this now. We've done the thing that we said was unfair because we've given two pieces of cake to service delivery, and no one else has any cake. It's very hard politically to do this in companies. But the reason we've given two pieces of cake to service delivery is because it hasn't cost us two data models to get there. It's cost us one data model and a bit of extra reporting. So our cost hasn't scaled to two. Mistake two. So um, the business won't identify the powerful network upgrade paths. Data models are a network. They're, they're a literal network of nodes with connections. 
Networks behave a certain way. So networks grow according to the network effect. The network effect is that value increases exponentially, maybe not value, but certainly possibility increases exponentially the more nodes and connections you add to the network. So here we have five telephones connected. If we start adding more nodes to it, the number of connections and the area of possibility that you can cover exponentially increases. And we're just adding um, one, two, three, four, five nodes, um, five new phones. So that's twice the amount of cost as that to build, but the space that it covers is, is vast. So if you see the network, you can add to it. So here, this is a possible upgrade path for the, for the business. Web pages, some of those contain products on them. We can make that connection. Service incidents also happen between customers and products. We can put that fact table in. Customers leave reviews. We can put that fact table in. So these just options that you can add. So this is good. So we've we instead of building a separate data model, we've reinvested and we're compounding in the data model we've got and we're extending its capability. So service delivery, they've got two pieces of cake. The, the extra bits we added to it have unlocked um, service incidents and reviews. They've unlocked some, um, some cake for marketing. But we haven't built two data models. We've just reinvested in the one we had. Mistake three, not upgrading core components and the connected reports. So if you remember this data model, we started to get, and, and I hear this in every single business, I've heard this in three now, um, a 360 degree view of the customer has started to be unlocked here. We've we've got we know their sales, we know their page views, we know their reviews, we know their service incidents. We're starting to get a real good sense of who this customer is. With that sense of um, with that knowledge, you can start to unlock um, customer segmentation. You can get your machine learning, or if you're feeling um, brave with R or Python, you can do a quick segmentation, and suddenly you've got features that you can latch onto and really apply a label, a meaningful label to the customer table. The advantage of applying a label to something you've retro, retrospectively built into reports is um, you can upgrade. As soon as you upgrade that node on the data model, you can just drag and drop that new label into all previous reporting. So you can upgrade all of this reporting, all of this reporting, all of this reporting, and all of this reporting just by adding a single label to one of your dimension nodes. So this is good. Suddenly we've 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 built on the original data model, we've reinvested, we've we've done our segmentation on a core node, we've retroactively applied that to the reports. Suddenly we've got six bits of cake, all for service delivery and marketing. Remember, cake is business value. And there's a bit of spillover for projects and HR and finance where they're interested in sales or products, but there's not a lot of um of spillover. Right. This is near, very near the end of the talk, so hopefully the pizza's coming soon. What we've done is we've we've got six pieces of cake with roughly one bit of cake of spillover. We haven't spent four data models to get there. We've only built maybe two, two data models worth from our original one. We've added a few nodes, a few connections, and we've done a segmentation. So we haven't spent the four data models we did in the original accounting, We've only spent one and a half, two, and we've got seven bits of cake, which is better than the five bits of cake we had before for the four data models. So the, the, basic, the basic thing that I haven't seen any business get right yet is don't spread your resource thin across separate projects. The economics are against you if you do that. We all know how Monopoly works. You do small house, small house, small house, big hotel, take advantage of the compounding, concentrate on your data model, try and build it out. Thank you. Um, feel free to add it, ask any questions. Um, the, the point of this for me is to network. I, I only live in Leeds. Um, I go to the user group there. That's my LinkedIn. If you want to add me as a connection, I won't refuse you. Um, Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Sean. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Any questions for Sean? Did you beat him? Teacher. Say again? Did you beat him eventually? No, never beat him. Never beat him, teacher. <laughs> <laughs>
that's an interesting. Um, God, we've got a question before I give my pontification. Building um, the overlapping speed for me is obviously a start rise, so it feels like it's it's going back. It's great. So brilliant to hear it's all about like that. When you're building a big enterprise data model, the sort of warehouse inside the building, so to speak. How do you do that with all experience in an agile way? Because people used to build those things in a water school way. No one, no one tolerates that anymore. How, how do you deliver these things in an agile way to deliver something new to get every more of them? So the, the key bit that hasn't happened in a lot of um, companies I've been in is they haven't done, they haven't realised what they've got and then done the listening for business issues. So if, you, if you're agile, you can build each component of the, the data model one at a time, customer table, and then you add a new table. And then the agile thing would be to listen to user feedback, work out where the reports are good, start to um, capitalise there, really try and explore that space and get business value. It's cheap to explore. So I see that's where the agile nature will come in. Wait, wait until, before you add a new component, wait and see if you can get feedback and exploration on the model you've already got. But it is hard, you're right. Building a sort of single customer dimension, for example, reporting on the right hand side, and if that's coming from like, you know, ten source systems and all those source systems are kind of changing, how do you kind of handle that? There are no easy answers. <laughs> so you know, <laughs> I hope you said <laughs> yeah, there are no easy answers. You are playing a complicated game. Yeah. Any other questions? Has anyone seen this in their organisations? Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. that you need an integration platform. You need somebody that understands integration that can centralise that and build a model that works for your business. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You just need something that sits in the middle that joins it all together. Yeah. Right. So what do you decentralize? So which is Dagamesh, I guess. Mulesoft, kind of something like Mulesoft, using APIs, one central place, yeah. and then you move the organization to having one central place to go and get the data from. It doesn't matter what it looks like at the other end. The consumers get the same interface, no matter what it looks like at the other end. And then when you move from, there's a, a, a chart further on where you have the extra entities. Yeah. That what would what would you describe that as? In a very simplistic form, if those entities if they were single entities. And it sounds it's fast in a format. I'd say it's like an it's like a knowledge graph, isn't it? Well yeah, you could describe it as graph data actually. Yeah. I, I think that looks like a graph database. And these little sparkles in between, that's your knowledge. That's your information that you can unlock within that. So I think you can do it without having to change all the systems underneath. You need a good information architect. Yeah. I, I think I, I like your points about APIs as well. That's why that's your contract. Mm -hmm. That's why you do, do, do find, you find the API, APIs. Well, then you perhaps create with the volatility behind the APIs that no one needs to worry about. You're the first audience for this talk. So if anyone really strongly disagrees or has any feedback, do come up to me afterwards and um, and disagree with me. Um, <laughs> I guess it depends on where you earn your money, doesn't it? Because if you are paid by an organisation and you work for that organisation, you're going to want to go down the second route. And if you're the CIO, Chief Information Officer, or Chief Data Officer, or whatever you want, you're going to want to go down the second road. Um, if you're a contractor, you're probably just happy going and delivering value here and value there and value there and value there and building all those expensive data models and saying to somebody, it would be a good idea to put all of these together. Now I've built five. Why don't I consolidate them all? Yeah. And I think sometimes you have to, it, it's a bit like, Customers sometimes have to see and feel the pain before they conceive a solution of a right way forward. And there's also got to be the political will in there as well, because if you're working in a business and an organization that has different profit centers and different business units, and you want to create one consolidated large data model, there's lots of politics in that. And then there's also, how much do I spend on that? What, you know, how much are you going to charge me as a business unit? 
Are you charging me by volume of data? Are you going to charge me in proportion to the amount of sales I make or the amount of profit I give to the company? So, you know, I think it's a fantastic talk in terms of opening up thought processes. Uh, I think we can probably all agree it's hard. Yeah. Yes. Just just building on a couple of the points, you, you're talking about agile and bringing those things together, moving systems. How much we're seeing customers and, and organizations who work with uh, adopting master data models and custom master data solutions so that, that you've got a single you know, point of fact that then all, all the various systems connect into. Yes, I think the master data movement is data modeling in disguise. They've just they've just made it sound more expensive. <laughs> this this is the core problem that I, I see. Um, this bit. If I if I can get to the right slide, yeah. This is what you see. So you see the data model. It makes sense to you to talk about the customer table, the product table, the web page table. This is what the business sees. They don't see any structure at all. They see two bits of reporting you deliver for two departments. They have no frame of reference to even talk about the data model. Um, but getting over that they, gap. Nor should they, well, because they're the business. Also, there's right. Nor should they. You know, there's a benefit by increasing data literacy, so that they can see more of the model and they understand, because they're going to come to you with that, that listening exercise. They're going to come to you. If they've got a better view of of, of what's going on with but, the data, but in some respects, this is like, and I, I, you know, respectfully disagree. In some respects, this is like me driving a car and saying, "Hey Ben, you have to understand how an electric engine or the internal combustion engine works." I don't. I just need to pay somebody to build the car. But we're talking about making decisions, and they're not paying you to make decisions. They want to keep the decisions. They're paying you to implement those decisions. So that's where the analogy slightly differs. Yeah. 